Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cato Institute. I'm Clark Neely, Vice President for Criminal Justice, and we're here today for our book forum on this book, Injustice for All, How Financial Incentives Corrupted and Can Fix the U.S. Criminal Justice System by Professors Chris Serpernant and Jason Brennan. Chris is Professor of Philosophy at the University of New Orleans, where he directs the university's honors program, and Jason is Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at Georgetown University. This book, I think, is, is one of the best distillations of the uh, basic issues in our criminal justice system that I've encountered uh, since I became uh, Vice President of Criminal Justice at Cato about three and a half years ago. And I really want to give as much time as possible um, for Chris and Jason um, to share with us uh, their insights about our criminal justice system. So I'm going to keep my opening remarks very short and simply say the following. I think it is extraordinarily important that we understand two things as clearly as possible. Um, the first is whether we do have a problem with our criminal justice system. Um, there are plenty of people, particularly on the right, who are quick to assure us that we do not. Um, there may be some sort of minor uh, issues that need tinkering around the edges, but there are no truly fundamental problems with our criminal justice system. So that's one question uh, that we'll deal with. Do we have serious fundamental problems? with our criminal justice system, because only then can we decide how to prioritize uh, or where to prioritize um, uh, criminal justice reform. Um, the second is trying to, uh, if we do have a problem, to correctly diagnose that problem, because of course, if you don't correctly diagnose the problem, it's virtually impossible to come up uh, with a cure. So those are the sort of two questions around which I'd like to frame this discussion and begin by welcoming uh, Chris and Jason to talk about their excellent book. Um, thanks to both of you for being here today. Um, I think uh, I'd like to start with, with you, Chris, uh, and then of course, uh, give Jason a chance to, to chime in after this. Um, do we have a problem? Are there fundamental problems with our criminal justice system or are our friends on the right uh, correct that the criminal justice system on balance works pretty well and at most we might need to do some tinkering around the edges, but really there's nothing here to worry about. What's your view? Well, I, I imagine if my answer was no, there's no problem, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. Um, so, so look, I, I mean, there, there's a problem and the, and the question really becomes where you want to identify that problem. And what Jason and I try to do with this in the book is to say, look, you know, when we look at the criminal justice system in this country, I, I think we can spot a number of different problems. And the question is, what is contributing to these problems and, and how do you resolve it? And so one of the things that we say fairly early on is that, you know, one of the things that, that's drawn a lot of attention or has gotten a lot of attention recently is issues of, of racial injustice in our criminal justice system. And, and there's no question that there are all sorts of racist laws and, and racist police officers and racist judges and, and racist whatevers through our criminal justice system. But one of the things that I think we show fairly convincingly is that it's it's not a pro it's not so much a problem of racism in the criminal justice system right if you got rid of racism tomorrow would all these problems go away no and that's the real problem like if you say that every single problem in our criminal justice system is connected to race it's connected to the color of people's skin and you then try to address those problems by addressing say issues of racism and solving for that what happens is that you don't see a lot of these problems go away. And so one of the things that Jason and I say is, look, there is a color problem in our criminal justice system, but it's not that it's the color of people, right? It's not that some people are black and some people are white, although, again, there are lots of problems when it comes to racism. What we argue is that the problem that affecting the criminal justice system is the color green, that a lot of what has motivated these decisions is money. And when you follow the money, you get to you know, similar problems, but at, for very different reasons. And so if you try to address these problems by addressing, say, financial incentives and thinking about solutions by reorienting the financial incentives, you're in a much better position to address these problems successfully than if you say, say it's, look, it's all racism all the way down. Um, and so that's, I think, our, one of our most significant contributions at this book is that the, the focus we think should be on these financial incentives and on the role that money's played in creating or crafting a lot of these policies and generating these outcomes, not just on 
on uh, race. Well, thanks for that, Jason. Before we turn to you, I wanted to make sure our listeners uh, understand that uh, they can submit questions and we would love to get your questions. This is a discussion today. We want to make sure that we're talking about the things that you are interested, uh, those of you who are uh, out there watching. And so once we've had a chance to kind of um, give um, uh, Jason and Chris an opportunity to quickly uh, set up the argument in the book, we certainly hope that you'll uh, come in with your questions. On Twitter, we're at hashtag CatoCJ, and you can submit your questions uh, through Facebook and YouTube as well. Um, Jason, would you pick up where Chris left off and, and share some more thoughts about the nature uh, of, the, of the essential problems in our criminal justice system as you see them? Yeah, great. So thanks for having me here, and thanks for doing this, by the way, and thanks for everyone who's listening. Uh, so the opening question was, well, who cares? Why do we care about this topic? And so I think it, you should care about it for a number of reasons. One is just if you have at all an ideal of a free society, that's not really compatible with having a huge percentage of people behind bars. And the numbers are staggering. There's something like 2.2 million people behind bars right now. There's another 7 million people that are in some form of carceral supervision. Something like one out of nine American men will spend time in jail at some point in their life. One out of three American uh, uh, black Americans. And even if we look at just things like white states like Wyoming, the incarceration rate there is incredibly high compared to almost any other country. But it's not just things like incarceration. It's how much contact people have with the police, how violent the police are in the U.S. compared to elsewhere. The severity and length of punishments are unusually high here. Uh, and also things like uh, when we ask, like, who cares? I'm not a criminal. I'm a law abiding citizen. Well, no, you're not. Uh, you probably, statistically speaking, you probably aren't. Um, in researching this book, we found, uh, depending on which scholar you look at and which estimate they use, you get something like between 50 and 80% of Americans uh, have done something which could put them in jail for a year. Most of us, and basically the reason we're not in jail is at the discretion of the people that are above us. So look, when we look at the, what the US was like, say 50 or 60 years ago, it was a little bit worse on most of these measures than other OECD countries. And over time, it's become a massive outlier where we have the highest incarceration rate in the world that we know of. I don't really know if I trust China statistics on this, but something is going wrong. Too many things are criminalized. They're punished too harshly. The system doesn't appear to be a, a working. Uh, it costs too much money. So that's a problem and we need to fix it. Well, that's great. So you mentioned something I think very important here that that we we need to tackle right up front. And and actually, Ross Levatter uh, asked a question that is I think exactly right for this part of the discussion. And that is, why are things so much worse in the U.S. than in OECD countries and similarly situated liberal democracies? Financial incentives affect people equally everywhere, do they not? Um, who wants to take that one? been on this because there are peculiarities to the U.S. system. It's not the same as elsewhere. So we think it it's a number of these things all put together and it's not like there's just one smoking gun and if you just fix this one issue, that'll be it. But it's a lot of things. So part of it starts with the issue of democracy and what we vote for. And Americans simply vote for more things uh, than people do in other kinds of countries. And that's a problem because unfortunately, democracy works. And what I mean by that is if you go and poll Americans and ask them their views about criminology, they know next to nothing about it. They don't know facts about crime statistics. People for the past, since 1994, Americans thought crime has been getting worse and worse when in fact crime has generally speaking been going down. And uh, it's been, it, crime is lower now in the US, maybe like last year would be a better example than it had been for a very long time, since really the 60s. Uh, murder rates are going down, but American voters don't know that. They don't know facts about what it takes to reduce crime. Uh, and so, the American voter faces an incentive problem in light of their vote. Individual votes count for very little. Thus, we're free to use them expressively and to like sort of form coalitions. And so when we have us vote for things like prosecutors and district attorneys and so on, or, or in some cases, judges, we're not going to use that vote very wisely. Uh, in other countries, those, apart, those are usually appointed by people who maybe know better. So then you have the incentive of po uh, politicians and so on. Their incentive is to look like they're being tough on crime. You know, imagine two different politicians, one who says, 
look, I've read all the books on criminology. How what is causing crime is really a big puzzle. No one really knows that. Why crime started dropping in 1994? No one really knows that. Uh, but we should really figure that out and try to do something about it. And then another person who says we need to put people in jail who commit crime. And you know, we're not going to give them educations because you know we don't even give free educations to like good, hardworking, honest Americans, let alone criminals. Who do you think they're going to vote for? They're going to vote for the person who has who looks like they're tough on crime. And that's one of many issues that are unique to the United States. There's other things about how uh, different centers are funded, about how prisons are funded and so on. And when we look at each of these things, we find them to be peculiar here. So I, my, my kind of generic story is the U.S. was sort of set up to be messed up. It was set up to have bad incentives. But there were a number of genuine shocks that occurred in the 60s and 70s with an unexpected rise in crime and the drug war itself also causing people to have a kind of moral panic. And then when that kicked in, that sort of lighted the tinder that the bad incentives sort of created. And that created this sort of vicious spiral of things getting worse and worse with our criminal justice system. Yeah. Um, so really quick, uh, the questions have already started coming in, which is great. We really thank you for those questions. Um, keep in mind on Twitter, we're hashtag uh, Cato CJ. You can also submit your questions through Facebook uh, and YouTube. Um, so Chris, um, two things it seems to me are true. Um, unlike uh, many people's impression, in fact, um, violent crime has been dropping uh, in the US for at least the last 25 years or so. On the other hand, we remain um, a particularly violent society in comparison to many other similarly situated countries. Um, Want to sort of unpack that for us and, and tell us what you think about the significance? Yeah, there's no question that when you look at violent crime statistics in the United States, it's been going down steadily for the last 20, 30 years, uh, starting in the mid 80s and early 90s. And, and I feel I get my chart right here with the mirroring. It's like this way, right? Just it's down, whatever the way that is with the mirroring, right? High at top, low at the bottom. But what's interesting is that, you know, the amount of violent crime that we see in the US on average is still relatively high. So per 100,000 people in this country, we have 400 instances of violent crime, which is roughly double the amount that you would see in Germany, you know, four times the amount that you would see in Italy, 10 times the amount, even more when you see in Japan. And so when you start comparing the levels of violent crime, even though they've been trending down in the U.S. to other nations, we still have significantly more violent crime, right? And so this is one of the problems. And people on the right say, well, look at this amount of violent crime. And we have a lot of it. And the problem is that when you look at national averages, that doesn't tell the story on violent crime either, because even if it's an average of, say, 400 instances of violent crime per 100,000 people, a lot of that is concentrated in certain areas. And so if you look at St. Louis, for instance, in 2018, you've got 1,800 instances of violent crime per 100,000 people. And, and so you're, you're looking at you know four and a half times the national average. And so this is what's complicated it is that you know violent crime has gone down, but we're seeing a lot of it concentrated in certain areas. And so the question ends up being, well, what do you do? Because on the one hand, violent crime goes down, but on the other hand, you see in a lot of our cities that you have significant amounts of violent crime, so much violent crime in some areas that you just wonder how people can live flourishing lives who live in those areas. So this is one of the challenges that we were trying to figure out when you look at, say, solutions to this is how do you address this? Because in some sense, the, the folks on the right are right in certain cities have a lot of violent crime. And so you're going to have to figure out what what to do about that. And we offer we offer some solutions to that. Great. So, you know, I think that sort of a a deep, dark secret, although it's no secret, of course, uh, among some of us, is that arguably the government itself can be criminogenic. Criminogenic is a word, of course, that means crime creating. Um, would it be fair to say that some of the policies that we have embraced as a country are themselves criminogenic? in the sense that they generate crime that would not otherwise have occurred. Jason, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the kind of audience that's inclined to, to listen to a Cato broadcast is already you know part of this story, um, though we might be inclined to exaggerate it, and that might be our issue. Uh, the drug war is criminogenic. Uh, people continue to want drugs even when you make them illegal. People continue to have access to these drugs, but you change who supplies them and the method in which they're supplied. 
So I have a drug dealer. I don't attend to go to my drug dealer very often anymore, thanks to the lockdowns. But my drug dealer is Starbucks, and they serve their drug in a wonderful form, and it comes beautifully displayed. And there's very little crime between Starbucks and other suppliers. But if you're using harder drugs than I do, then you're likely to be buying it illegally. And so you're having cartels or others that are supplying the product who are then you know, being sold by criminal people on the streets and they're likely to fight over territory and so on. And you get black market conflicts. We have this with alcohol with during prohibition in the United States and we continue to have this with drugs. Everyone's aware of that. And it's not just the conflict there, but also the fact that oftentimes sales are sold, like are concentrated in certain places and that in turn causes increased crime and so on. But there's other policies that are criminogenic in ways that are less obvious to people. Like consider the prison system. It's, and I'm sure we'll spend more time talking about this later, but it really isn't obvious on a deep level that if somebody commits a crime, the way that you punish them is to throw them in jail. That's a relatively recent invention. It wasn't like that through all of history. It's not obviously the most effective mechanism. But one thing that is clear is that it's criminogenic. Think about what would happen if I were to go to jail right now for, say, three years. I'd lose my job. I'd probably like lose contact with my family. I'd lose contact with my friends. I'd be ostracized by people. I'd have no income and so on. And you're putting me in... Uh, a camp with other people who are also criminals. So you cut off people's ties to their community. You cut off ties to their community, uh, to their friends and family. You cut off their ability to earn income. You ruin their reputations and prevent them from earning future income. And on top of that, you're having them hang out with other criminals who will teach them criminal ways in a hard and harsh environment where in order to survive, you have to be in a way harsh and hardened. Like that's criminogenic too. So a lot of it, and those are just a few of the elements of what we do that are criminogenic, but yes, it's criminogenic all around. And is it your position that some of these dynamics that we've been discussing also have had an impact on uh, how violent our police are? Maybe first explain whether it's your view that American police tend to be more violent than police um, in comparable countries. And if so, um, you know, can you give us some sense of why you think that might be? You know, a, a shocking and interesting statistic we found when studying this was the German police, and I think 2018, fired bullets outside of a firing range about 52 times. I'm sorry, they fired 52 bullets. Maybe it was like 54. It was around that. Whereas American police will kill something like a thousand people per year in the line of duty, and they fire their guns, of course, a lot, lot more often. But it's not just that. It's also the questions about how how they treat people and so on. And this is a case where I think the libertarian story about the war on drugs does a lot. It has a lot of explanatory power. Um, starting in the 1980s, uh, you have this transfer program that appears um, through the federal government of giving excess military equipment to uh, local police officers and local police branches. And now you see this is spread all throughout the country where it might be your, you have a town of 10,000 people, but you have machine guns and tanks and things like that that you've gotten from the Pentagon. And the thing about this is not only you're getting that, but you're being incentivized to use it. You're getting money uh, that's attached to being trained in certain kinds of military tactics. And if you're a local police officer, like if you're a local branch, you want that increased budget. You might want the increased salary that comes from being trained in SWAT methods. Even things about how police officers are funded uh, or police branches are funded. But you think about like in many in many towns, if you don't use your entire budget, you don't get as much of a budget next year. But if you do use your entire budget, then you can prove that you need an increased budget the next year. A good way to increase your budget is to and increase your spending is to simply use a lot of military tactics and use this kind of equipment. We have these perverse incentives, a lot of which come from the drug war. Another statistic was um, uh, SWAT teams. When you think about what a SWAT team ought to be used for, uh, what should they be used for? Well, probably for things like a hostage scenario or an active shooter. But overwhelmingly, SWAT teams are used to deliver drug warrants for people that are not a credible threat. Just that guy sells meth over there. He's at home right now. Let's have six armed officers break into his house with a SWAT team unit. Ninety, Something like 90 to 95% of SWAT team deployments are for things like that. It's not necessary. It's not necessary in part because we need to criminalize drugs. But we don't need to get into that. But it's not necessary because it's just not an effective use of force. Um, in the 1970s, it was something like there might be about 500 SWAT deployments per year. Now it's roughly 100 per day. It's probably lower because of COVID, but like last year, it was like 100 per day, overwhelmingly for people who are not a violent threat, and you could have just sent beat cops after them. Yeah, and unfortunately, we know very well that that creates an extraordinarily hazardous situation 
Um, the, the killing of Breonna Taylor uh, in Louisville, Kentucky is still much discussed. Um, her boyfriend took a shot uh, at, at what turned out to be police coming into the home. He claims uh, that he didn't realize who they were. He thought maybe it was a, a violent uh, um, invasion. Um, Chris, uh, th that in light of some what we see sometimes happening between cops and cops, that seems perhaps a plausible concern. Would that, is that right? Well, look, it, it was a violent invasion, right? They, they hadn't done anything wrong. And here you've got people with guns busting down your door in the middle of the night. I mean, that's if that's not the definition of a violent invasion, I, I don't know what it is. And, you know, one of the things that we do in the book is we, we highlight all sorts of stories like this where we hear about Breonna Taylor and we say and we, we think, oh, no, this 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 is so outrageous. Right. And, and the problem ends up is that you see these stories all the time. And so we have a bunch where, where we, we tell stories or we show stories of, of police, different departments and units fighting with each other over who gets to do what in the policing of some of these crimes. And so my, my favorite one is that you had two police, uh, poli um, you know, I believe it's either state police, or you had two different counties, right? And they were fighting with each other over who got to police the uh, east to west part of the highway, right? So there was an interstate highway running through Tennessee, right? There are a number of them, but there was one that goes all the way up, you know, go up to the northeast. And then you've got two sections of the highway, right? You've got the, ca the, the cars that are going from the west to the east, and you have the cars that are going from the east to the west. Well, the police officers were fighting about who got to police for the stops, the ones that are going from the east to the west. Because the thing was is that when they go from the west to the east, they're bringing drugs from the west and from up from Mexico up to the northeast, right? The, but when they get stopped, what do the departments do? Well, they have to seize the drugs. Well, the drugs have no value to them, right? They've got to destroy them. But when you get to police the cars that are going from the east to the west, right, you're not seizing drugs anymore. What you're doing is seizing large amounts of cash that are being brought back in these sales. And so the police departments got to keep the cash. And so you saw them literally, literally, and sometimes fighting with each other to the point where they had to get, you know, court decisions as to who gets the police. And they, they come to official agreements. Well, on three days a week, we get to do it. The other days you get to do it. It's, it's crazy. But when you see stories like this and realize like this is not an exception, this is how this stuff happens, you realize how important these incentives are and a lot of what drives a lot of these decisions. Well, thanks for that. Uh, so there was a, uh, I want to remind people to uh, continue submitting your questions. We've already gotten some great ones. Thanks for that. Uh, we're on Twitter, um, hashtag CatoCJ. You can ask questions through Facebook and, and YouTube as well. We had one um, viewer who asked, uh, what is the program that supplies military surplus weapons that was referred to earlier? That's the 1033 program. Um, and you can look that up. It's pretty horrifying. Um, one of my favorite, not favorite statistics from that is that something like, um, I can't remember the exact figure, but maybe 60,000 bayonets have been distributed through the 1033 program. Um, I'm, I'm still stumped as to what a possible uh, legitimate law enforcement use of a, of a bayonet might be. Um, but let's put a pin in that and turn to something that I think is in some ways um, perhaps the most controversial uh, uh, passage in the book. And this is where you discuss um, whether incarceration is an appropriate punishment. We've become used to incarceration as the default uh, method of punishing people uh, who've been committed or convicted of crimes in this country. Um, but you argue quite provocatively in the book um, that there are both uh, practical and moral concerns about using incarceration as our default form of punishment. Um, Jason, I wonder if you could kick off our discussion about that. Yeah, thanks very much. And so, as you said, it's we're accustomed to thinking of if you commit a crime, you go to jail. That's the way that you punish people. Well, it's not written into the fabric of the universe that that's what, that's what you should do. There's all sorts of things we could do. And historically, actually, the use of incarceration was often frowned upon because the thought was, well, now you're getting like, a, you're just getting fed by other people and you're idle. Like, why should you have, why should you get to do that as a punishment? Um, so like in history, you can think of things like there's been expulsion. If you're forced to maybe leave your hometown or you're kicked out of the society, maybe some of your property is, is confiscated. Maybe you lose some of your legal rights, but you're otherwise allowed to be free. In the past, people are often made slaves or forced to go work in the military as a result of like uh, committing crimes. We've killed people. We commit, we inflict pain upon them. We might humiliate them. Mutilation. Sometimes you have partial confinement. You're required to stay at home, but you can't go elsewhere. Forced labor and so on. These are all historical punishments that lots of societies have used. 
Now, we're not necessarily advocating any of those other ones in favor of it. I don't think we should enslave people if you commit a crime. I'm not in favor of mutilating people. But one of the things we focus on is the question of, say, caning as an alternative uh, to incarceration. And we're not there do that, doing that because we think it's the best solution or that's what we ought to do, but to point out how on a kind of pairwise comparison, it looks like it's superior in almost every single case. And for almost every reason people would offer in favor of, uh, of um, incarceration, you should pick caning instead. So we think about the deterrent effect. There's actually very weak sociological or uh, evidence that uh, incarceration really reduces the amount of time that people are like the threat of incarceration has a very weak effect on stopping people from committing crime. Increasing the sentence length has a very weak effect. It's really more about the certainty of being caught. It's not so much about the punishment. Um, so that's one of the problems with it. So it doesn't have a big deterrent effect. It doesn't really seem to have a strong incarcerating people doesn't really seem to feel our uh, sense of justice. Like we, we want to get back at the criminals and it doesn't really seem to do that. But beyond that, incarceration is in, in many respects, just a lot more cruel. So to illustrate that, just think of the following. Imagine you were caught, say, stealing a car and the judge says to you, you can spend a year in a typical American prison, uh, or you can be flogged 15 times and set free. I, I bet you would take the flogging, wouldn't you? Um, because you're like if you go to prison, there's a pretty high chance that you'll be sexually assaulted, that you'll catch various diseases, that you'll lose your family and lose your job and all these other sorts of things. If you were simply flogged and then sent on your way, you'd be punished and then you would, but your life would go on. So in many respects, it's a lot less cruel. In fact, our criminal justice system reflects that because of the punishments that we attach to what you would get if you did that to other people. If I were to take Chris and flog him 15 times, I might get... Um, about you know three to five months of prison time as a punishment for having flogged him. If I were to kidnap him and put him in my basement for five months, I would get many years of prison time. So our own criminal justice system reflects the idea that to put someone in confinement is worse than to simply hit them with a cane. So it's strange because we our reaction is, oh, it's horrible to hurt people, but putting them in jail is fine. But in fact, putting them in jail is a lot less humane. But not only is it less like humane, it's also more criminogenic for the reasons we talked about earlier today. You're making it more likely people will commit crimes in the future. So the only thing where jail seems to work the best in is if you have someone who is an ongoing threat. This person has committed a crime, a violent crime, and if you let them go, they're likely to continue committing violent crimes right now. That's the case where you have a strong reason to remove them from others in order to protect others from them. So that might be, though, the limiting case. In most other cases, you could use alternative punishments. Maybe we should use caning. Maybe we should just require people to pay off a debt to the person that they've harmed. Maybe we should require them to do forced labor on behalf of society. Maybe we should require something else. But incarceration, it's not very effective, and it's really only good for a certain limited case. Well, that's... Um... That's something I think people don't really think about, and perhaps they should. Um, Chris, you know, another point in the book that is so poignant is that the method uh, that we choose as our default for punishing people doesn't just punish um, the, the convicted uh, individual, punishes others as well. Can you elaborate on that a bit and also maybe touch on um, the, the, the additional perverse um, incentive structures it, it causes by creating an effective class of people who make a living caging human bodies. So let's talk about the the the, the other um, people besides defendants who get um, punished as well through incarceration. Yeah. So, you know, Jason and I both have backgrounds in philosophy. We have PhDs in philosophy. And, and every once in a while, we like to think about issues of justice. And when you think about punishment and justice, one of the important things is that what you don't do and what's not justified is punishing or harming people who have done nothing wrong. Now, in any system of punishment, in any system where you, you have to find people guilty and innocent, you, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, and we certainly make enough mistakes and mistakes are gonna be unavoidable and that's just gonna happen. But when you look at a system of punishment that uses incarceration as the primary method, we know off the bat, even when you incarcerate, even if you incarcerated 100% of the people who were guilty and never incarcerated anyone who wasn't guilty, you're still doing harm, you're still causing harm, you're still punishing people who have done nothing wrong. The family members and the people in the community of the people who are being incarcerated. 
And, and so this is one of the challenges. Like if you believe in justice and believe that someone who hasn't done anything wrong shouldn't be punished, then we have to think about how do we go about punishing people appropriately, but to do it in a way that doesn't harm people who haven't done anything wrong. And you might say, well, you know what? Too bad for those children, right? It's just too bad for that five-year-old or too bad for that eight-year-old that, you know, his parent, father did something wrong. That's just bad luck. And, and that to me is just, it's not acceptable. That's not an acceptable answer. And it's especially not an acceptable answer when we know that the vast majority of these people who are being locked up are poor. And in many cases, they're, they're black or they're members of other minority groups. And so that's a problem right off. Uh, you know, it becomes even more problematic than when you see, you know, not just who's being incarcerated and why, but but how they're being used. And so this is this has become more in the public light. You know, recently when you look at, you know, people being worked when they're in prison and they're working for free for the state. So this is this has become a problem in in Louisiana, but really around the country. Uh, not too long ago, uh, our current governor John Bell Edwards. Uh, uh, released a significant number of people from prison early as a way of testing to see whether or not we could identify the people who wouldn't reoffend. Uh, not only did a bunch of sort of folks on the right uh, oppose this, but but some of the sheriffs did. And, and the sheriff sheriff down in Caddo Parish, so we don't have counties, we have parishes, right? The sheriff of of Caddo Parish came out and said, "Well, look, you know, not only are they releasing some bad ones, but they're releasing all these good people, right? They're releasing these good prisoners." who are doing free labor for us in our prisons. They're repairing our vehicles. They're cutting the grass. They're doing all sorts of things. And you read this and you go, I, I know they're all thinking that, but I can't believe that someone just said that. Um, and so, you know, I think this is the other problem is that who we're incarcerating and why and who is profiting off of it adds an additional layer to this problem. There's an entire industry now that's sprung up over keeping these people in cages and profiting off of them being in cages. And, and really, it's, it's all the way down, right? It's, it's service providers who are providing services to the prisons. It's, it's the wardens and the people who, have, you know, who are getting paid from this. It's politicians who, say, have prisons in their district. And so either they're receiving you know, greater you know, amount of weight because of how we count prisoners in the census or because now the prisons are providing jobs to people in their districts. Again, it's all the way down, and the people who are being harmed, for the most part, are people who possess fairly low or almost no political capital, and they're often poor. And so this is, this is a real problem if you care about this issue from the standpoint of justice. Uh, and so that was one of the things we wanted to look at in this book as well. So um, I know from some of the questions we've gotten uh, so far that people are eager to hear us talk about solutions in addition to problems. But I think that before we get there, we really do have to first talk um, about uh, at least one more really fundamental concern in our system. Um, and that is I, I have become increasingly convinced, and I know that you discuss this in your book, I've become increasingly convinced that it is impossible to have mass incarceration without mass adjudication. Um, and the constitutionally prescribed mechanism for obtaining a criminal conviction um, is rather complex and inefficient. And of course, it culminates in what is arguably the most inefficient part of the entire process, which is a criminal jury trial. Now, as we know, and I'd like to sort of throw out for discussion, the criminal jury trial, although it is the constitutionally prescribed mechanism for adjudicating criminal charges in this country, is now practically extinct on American soil. 95% of all criminal convictions today are obtained through guilty pleas. Literally people who have chosen to waive their constitutional right to a trial, which might even lead to an acquittal, regardless of whether they're guilty or innocent, and instead simply condemn themselves. Let's start with those figures. Does the fact that 95% of all criminal convictions and over 90% of all criminal defendants choose, again with quotes, to waive their right, constitutional right to a jury trial suggests that there is something problematic going on behind the scenes. Um, somebody kick us off. I mean, there's so many things to say about that. And, and you're right. Uh, I mean, the amount of criminalization that we have is in part facilitated by the fact that people usually just take a plea bargain. That enables the state to throw more people in jail. It enables them to use their resources in you know, creating the, the criminal justice edifice we have, but not worrying about the incredibly expensive part, which is really going through a trial, 
right? There's just not funding from that. It also takes citizens out because as citizens, we have the ability to engage in jury nullification. We don't. And if you try to show up at a court and inform people of that they have that right to do so, you're likely to be uh, imprisoned or hurt for doing so. But you do have the right to do that. But if lots of these crimes are never actually being seen by a jury of your peers, then you're not going to have awareness of these things from people. I mean, imagine if every time someone went to jail, we had to get 12 people. All of us would be serving on juries all the time and we'd be getting fed up with it and we'd fight against it and start voting against it. But we don't. I mean, I've never gone, I've never actually been called for jury duty. I never actually, you know, I get the envelope in the mail and I never have to end up going, which is too bad because I would, you know, engage in jury nullification for sure. Uh, so beyond that, though, prosecutors have tremendous power to force people uh, to accept the charges against them by double counting. You know, if you think about like an automobile, you might be like, well, I have the car. But in addition to have the car, I also have an engine and I have the headlights and I have the seat and I have the seat belt. I'm just double counting parts of the car. Right. It's all one thing. When it comes to crime, though, the, the way that charges have been created if you commit one crime, we can split that up into multiple different things, which I can then throw at you. I can say, I'm going to charge you with 12 different, you, you beat up one person, I'm going to charge you with 12 different crimes. But if you agree that you, uh, you committed the crime then, and you take a plea bargain, we'll give you a reduced sentence um, compared to what we could give you if it went to trial. And I won't charge you with all of that. Beyond that, you also have the use of, uh, of bail and bail was originally meant in a way to just in sort of ensure that we're going to let you go free but we have a cash bond and if you don't come back we can keep that you'll forfeit it so you have an incentive to return empirically speaking uh, the literature on this doesn't actually do much to support the use of bail it doesn't look like it's really all that important for making people show up on time but beyond that what ends up happening is someone like me if i were accused of if i were accused of murder or something and they had like a massive uh a bond for me to go free, I can afford to pay it one way or another, but many people can't. And so the poorest among us then are just forced to sit in jail for long periods of time, having not been convicted of a crime, lose their jobs, lose their family, lose their reputations, be assaulted by others and mistreated in jail and so on. In fact, some of the numbers are staggering. 60% of women who are behind bars right now in the United States have not been convicted of a crime. They are there awaiting trial. 60%. So statistically speaking, if you are a woman in, behind bars who has been convicted of a crime, you are unusual. The normal thing is to have not been convicted of a crime. So we're ruining people's lives uh, over the system, and it gives tremendous power to prosecutors who all they really care about is that they win, right? That's what, that's what in order to advance in your career as a prosecutor, you need to just win as much as possible. You need to prove that you put a lot of people behind bars and you gave them very long sentences. That's the thing that helps you. So um, there's an interesting statistic in the book that, um, uh, like some cities, New Orleans has what's called a bail fund, which is um, you know a charitable organization that puts up bail money uh, for people who are locked up awaiting trial. Um, and in the book, you say that 80% of the time, 8-0, 80% of the time that someone gets bailed out by the New Orleans bail fund, the DA decides to drop the charges. This seems to suggest that uh, pretrial incarceration is among the very powerful levers uh, that prosecutors have to induce people uh, to plead guilty. And that if they lose that lever, it seems like um, much of the time they simply decide to drop the case because it's not worth uh, pursuing if they don't have that lever to apply. Let me, uh, say, let, let me suggest that we change gears because we're getting some great questions and I want to make sure we're including the audience. Again, you can submit your questions through Twitter, hashtag CatoCJ. Facebook and also YouTube. Um, uh, one question that we, we probably need to return to uh, in the context of, of thinking about solutions um, is police violence. This is something that is very much on people's mind. It's very clearly among the key pathologies in our criminal justice system. Um, it's one of the things that causes the most friction, the most disenchantment. Um, so Chris, would you, you know, sort of See if you can give us some sense of encouragement about whether there's there's uh, some meaningful ability to address police violence and perhaps also uh, touch on the uh, defund, uh, so-called defund movement, if you would. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm usually the the happy, optimistic one of, of the me and Jason uh, pair here. Um, look, we, we provide a number of alternatives and things that we can do in the book, but but let me suggest one that we talk about something that we didn't put in the book because because people watching this can go read the book and we've got some suggestions there. 
Uh, think about, so a police officer comes and he shoots a unarmed civilian. And we find out later that there was no good reason to have that person shot. Uh, the family of that person goes and sues the police department, sues the city. Uh, and a jury awards that family member of the person who was shot a significant amount of money. And so one of the things right now is, is who pays that? Well, it's the taxpayers of the city where you know, the person was shot that end up paying that bill. And so one of the things, if you believe that, say, if you change financial incentives or you adjust financial incentives, you can get better outcomes, is it, to think about, say, alternatives that might motivate the police to, say, not shoot people. Um, and so one of the things that you see in other areas, so look at, say, teachers unions, um, that if you have a teacher who has uh, committed some act of misconduct and you have a similar situation where the family either sues the teacher or sues the schools, in, in, many, in many cities, many municipalities, uh, it's the teacher's pension fund that pays any verdict against the teacher. And there's no reason why you couldn't see something similar with police departments, that instead of taking the money from, say, the general funds of, of the city or the municipality, have the police officer's pension fund pay that verdict. One of the things that I think you would see under those cases is that you would see people be more willing to say police themselves, right? The police officers understand that if someone does something wrong or you create a culture where those types of incidents are likely to take place, you're the one that's ultimately going to be harmed in addition to the person that you, you've shot and killed and whatever else. And so one of the things that you could, you could look at is, is that. Now, that's slightly different from, say, defunding the police. And when people talk about defunding the police, what that means is a variety of things across the board, depending on who you're talking with. Uh, and when you talk with police departments and police officers, many of them will readily admit that what they're being asked to do right now, say, welfare checks or, or other things along those lines, are things that they weren't not only not trained to do, but are things that they don't want to do. And so one of the things that when we see, say, uh, a defund the police movement that makes sense is, say, reducing the police budget in certain ways that allows, say, those services or, or those tasks to be offloaded to people who are perhaps better suited to address those things. And I think that's one of the things that we're looking at, say, with sensible defunding the police departments. It's not like, look, we need to eliminate all police departments. We need to eliminate sort of everything that's going on with the police. Some people think that, I'm not sure either of us think that that's reasonable, but there are all sorts of jobs that the police are doing right now that they're being, you know, like not paid to do, but part of their budget is going to where you say, why are people with guns going and doing this? Why are people who have been trained to use those guns going and taking on these jobs? Uh, and that's sort of a, a, another shift that if you say you take that money away from the police department and you allocate it to, say, other organizations that may be better suited to do those things, what you may see is and probably would see a significant reduction in violent encounters, right? And if you want to try to reduce the violence, to reduce these violent encounters between police officers and, and civilians, one of the things that you can do is, is, say, remove the number of opportunities for the police to encounter civilians in this way. Jason, the defund movement is obviously very much on people's minds, so I think it, it bears uh, further um, comment. Um, what are your thoughts on whether defund the police is the right strategy? Um, and if not, what's a more fine-tuned or, or a, a strategy that has uh, more chance of success? Right. Uh, one of the issues we face is, you know, human beings are strategic actors. I can announce a policy, but I don't get to decide how people react to the policy. So a worry that I have, which I think we're seeing evidence of this already occurring in different parts of the country, is we might just get something called the Washington Monument effect. Uh, the idea is like if you threaten to reduce the National Park Service's budget, they don't respond by cutting the parks that nobody goes to. They respond by cutting the Washington Monument, making it so you can't go there. And that's a very popular park. And then people come and they see the damage done to the Park Service by the reduced budget. They complain to their Congress people. And lo and behold, their budget is increased once again. So with police officers, given that they're willing to like kill people on camera, they have a body camera and they're willing to shoot people and play high Simon Says with them, I think they might be willing to engage in that kind of behavior too. So we have to be careful with that. If we simply threaten to cut police officers' budgets, it doesn't mean that they'll behave better. It might mean that they'll behave worse in order to make us come crying back to them and say, we're sorry we ever cut your budget. Here's more money. 
Um, so that's that's a threat, and we don't get to decide how they'll react. But secondarily, policing is not inherently a bad thing. In if you go around and interview, say, uh, people in minority neighborhoods and ask them, like, do you want reduced policing? Very few of them say yes. Overwhelmingly, they say, no, we want to keep the police. We just want the police to behave better. That's the issue. And in a sense, they're right, because even though it's unclear exactly what reduces crime and what increases it, I mean, I've read all these books on criminology now, and it's surprising how much disagreement there is and how few things have really been established. But one thing that has been established is that police presence reduces crime, and people know that. So you want police around, you just want them to behave better. In fact, one of the perverse incentives we talk about early in the book is how local jurisdictions have a weird incentive not to use the police, but to substitute imprisonment for increased policing because of the way things are funded. If we, the local district, have more police officers, we have to pay for that. That comes out of our budget for everything else. That comes from our taxpayers. The taxpayers don't really want to pay it at a local level. I'm the town alder person. I'm trying to win re-election. I want to reduce taxes here. Uh, and that might mean having reduced police presence. But if we sort of substitute policing, um, incarceration for policing, well, they'll probably go to a, a, uh, a county or a state prison, and then they'll be paid for by everybody. We can externalize the cost of criminal justice onto the state and other taxpayers, not just local taxpayers. So we have to be really careful. Policing is, I, 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 I'm in many respects anti-police, so I kind of hate to say this, but policing is in many respects a good thing. It just needs to be done better. We need different training programs, different ways of using weapons to eliminate the use of SWAT teams. There's no reason for any town that has under 100,000 people to have a SWAT team. We have to stop... Um, we have to like basically make them pay the cost of their own malfeasance, et cetera, et cetera. But just getting rid of police is not the answer. Well, um, I want to remind people again to uh, submit your questions through YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, where we are hashtag CatoCJ. We've gotten some great questions. Really appreciate people uh, participating so actively. I want to specifically thank uh, Patrick Camera from YouTube for asking a question that has to get asked every single time you have an event like this, which is, isn't this really the fault of the private prison system and their nefarious lobbyists? Chris, what can you tell us about that? This, this is the question that anytime I go and give a talk on this topic, either the first or second question that gets asked is about private prisons. And I mean, look, there, there's all sorts of moral, interesting moral discussions about whether these sorts of jobs should be offloaded to private companies and especially private companies that are making profit off of them. Jason and I may actually disagree on this, but but think about it from the standpoint of what's happening in practice. A very small percentage of the people who are incarcerated in this country are incarcerated in private prisons. It's so small that it doesn't even it doesn't even matter. Now, from a standpoint of justice and morality and ethics and and whether the government should be offloading these services onto private companies, I, I get it. It, it. It's it's an issue, but in practice, private prisons don't really even make a dent in things. Now, here's the other side of this, is that people have a problem with private prisons because they're being run for profit, right? For, for say, the Geo Group or CoreCivic, right? They're being run for the profit of the shareholders. They're being run in some ways for the profit of the people who are the CEO and who are working for the company, who are making salaries off of it. But think about it this way. All of the public prisons, the ones that are run by your state, the ones that are run by your county, they're all being run for profit as well. They're being run for the profit of the people who are working in them, right? The prison guards, the wardens, the sheriffs, right? They're being run for the profit of the people who pay for the, who, who provide services to those prisons. That when you're looking at the problems with prisons in this country, if we focus on private prisons and say that there's something fundamentally wrong with private prisons because people are profiting off of them, that misses the point that people are profiting off of prisons right now and the prisoners in there, whether they are technically for profit, right, or whether they are the state ones. The same sorts of bad things are happening in both of them. And this is one of the examples of the type of thing that, you know, you identify the problem, but the problem isn't necessarily what we, what we believe it is, or at least what gets the headlines. Again, in an ethics class or in a philosophy class or in a class on philosophy of law or a class on justice, it's a really interesting discussion whether uh, a state or a government should be offloading, you know, punishment onto like a private company and whether the private company should be in charge of doing that. So that's a really interesting moral question. But again, from the standpoint of what's happening in practice, ew, like 
look at what's going on in these public prisons as well. And they're just as bad, if not worse, as what you see in the private ones. An opportunity even here, as small a piece of the, the, the overall puzzle as private prisons are, there's even an opportunity to get the incentives better aligned here, isn't there? Issue with them is how they're paid. And this, I teach a class actually on nonprofit management and the incentive problems that nonprofits face. And this, and all nonprofits really face this problem, and private prisons do as well. If you have a charity, like imagine it's against malaria or whatever it might be, you have the problem that the people that you're serving and the customer are distinct, right? So if something is good for the people you're serving, but the customer, the person who actually pays for the charity doesn't like it, you're likely to go with what the donors want rather than what's actually good. Now, private prison companies are being run for profit, so they have a different incentive as well. But think about how they get their money. The customer here is the government. The government is offering them a certain amount of money in exchange for providing some level of regulated services in return. Uh, but the government doesn't necessarily have a very strong incentive to like make sure the services are done all that well. What if we changed the customer and made it the prisoner? So imagine something happens like this. You're convicted of a crime and you have to go to jail, uh, which I don't think is, as we said before, I don't think is a good idea in most cases, but you have to go to jail of a certain sort. But now you get a $15,000 voucher or $20,000. Uh, in California, they're spending about $70,000 per prisoner. So let's make it $50,000 there. You get a $50,000 voucher and now you have a bunch of private prison companies competing for you to pick them to go to their prison. And they're going to compete on quality like, you know, and they're all profit. They're a bunch of sociopaths. They just want as much money as possible. So the first one says, we'll give you a mat to sleep on and one bologna sandwich per day. And then the second one says, we'll give you a mat, like a mat and a pillow and two bologna sandwiches. And the first one says, well, we still have to compete. So we'll offer you more and more. They're going to compete on quality to try to get you, the prisoner, to select them as the prison to go to. You can even imagine them saying something like, we'll let you keep some of that money and put it in a bank account um, for when you leave. And so now you're competing on quality and price. If you change who pays and how they get paid, you take the same prison companies with the same sociopaths running them, and you switch for the behavior from trying to cut corners as much as possible to trying to offer as good of experience as possible, because that's what it takes to get the money. So the issue is not that they're greedy. It's not that they're mean. It's the way that they're getting paid. When the government is the customer, they act the way that they do now. If you made the prisoners the customer, you would get better behavior. Oftentimes when I've suggested this in the past, I get reactions from people saying, no, I don't like that idea because now I worry the prisons will be too nice. So a question that uh, has come up a couple times, including from um, a Cato sponsor, Don Beldovin, um, I want to touch on really quick. It's a little bit off topic, but, but we've had two, two people ask about it. So back to our discussion earlier about rethinking our default uh, mechanism for, for in, imposing punishment, which is incarceration. Um, you guys, again, very provocatively talked about flogging. Um, did did either of you uh, look at the at the um, the constitutional jurisprudence on that? Is that uh, uh, consistent or inconsistent with the Eighth Amendment as the Supreme Court interprets it, or have they looked at it? Because I actually don't know the answer to that question. I did actually look that up. I wasn't able to find Supreme Court cases on it or it being ruled as unconstitutional, even at a lower level. It's just something that kind of disappeared over time. I think the last time that flogging was prescribed in the United States was like around like 1952 in Delaware. Uh, it's just, and people just stopped using it. And part of it was because uh, the people administering the punishment didn't like doing it. So there was complaints from the administration. It was just seen as barbaric and it is barbaric. We're not even saying it's not barbaric. Flogging people is barbaric. Right. It's just, you know, if I had to choose between the barbarism of being flogged or the barbarism of going to an American prison, I would certainly pick being flogged. Um. So we've got um, just about a little over five minutes left, and I want to give you each an opportunity, you know, to sort of um, explain in some ways what a radical book this is. And the way I want to tee it up is this. You make an observation near the end of the book that I strongly agree with, uh, which is that the problem is not so much in identifying potential solutions, because if we just get the incentives uh, better, m much of the pathology will will dissipate. Uh, the problem, as, as I understand you to say at the end of the book, and as I feel very strongly, is that the system itself um, has almost become you know, self-aware. It's a $300 billion 
industry that you refer to a, a number of times in the book as the prison industrial complex. It provides a tremendous number of jobs to some of the most politically influential people in the country, police prosecutors and prison guards, um, which we could refer to as the law enforcement lobby. So here's a question I wanna ask you. Um, is it really realistic to suppose that we might be able to address and ultimately solve some of these problems from within the political system, or made it, might it be necessary um, to think about salt problems or solutions, I'm sorry, that can be imposed from outside the system? So let me offer you that as an opportunity to talk about what you consider to be um, perhaps the most radical yet promising uh, solutions that you propose in the book. Why don't we start with you, Chris? So. Thanks, thanks for that. I mean, I think when you think about criminal justice reform, I think everyone thinks about reform of what happens to people after they've encountered the police. And a lot of what I'm interested in is reforms or things that happen before people encounter the police, right? And so one of the things we talk about in the book is how you can reduce the number of, of things that are criminalized and how this would reduce the police encounters. And I think that would be a, a great thing to do. One of the other things that I don't think gets enough play uh, is investment in communities and community development. And so one of the things that we've seen is the best way to say reduce crime and increase opportunities is to encourage entrepreneurship in certain communities. And when you encourage people from those communities to start businesses and create businesses, especially ones that are taking up physical space, what you see is you see a sense of ownership in those communities, you see a sense of pride in people's communities, and people generally don't break things that are their own, right? When, they, when they're living in a nice place, they wanna take care of it. And so this is one of the challenges that we're seeing right now is that it's, it's far more difficult to get people to spend tax dollars on really important community development initiatives. And when they do, what you see are all these sorts of messed up things like opportunity zones that are, are at least in, in New Orleans and a lot of other places are causing, are leading to people who are not from these communities going into these communities, building things, and ultimately kicking the people who were in those communities out. This is a problem. If you want to try to fix a lot of these problems in this country, you have to look at the opportunities. You have to look at where people are living. You have to see where, where there's a lot of crime. You have to think about why is there crime in these communities and then think about how to fix it. You know, we can do all sorts of things that might fix problems after police encounter people on the streets, right? We can fix the prosecution situation. We can fix uh, incarceration. We can fix the punishments, but that doesn't fix the problems. We need to put people in, an, in a position where they have opportunities, where they don't want to commit crime, where they, where they see themselves with a reasonable chance to, to thrive and live good lives. And so we've been spending a lot of time at the University of New Orleans and in New Orleans focusing on entrepreneurship and how we can encourage people to do the sorts of things in their own communities that help those communities thrive, that drive down the cost, cost of crime, and ultimately make a lot of these things that we're talking about hopefully less relevant. Uh, and so for me, that's the optimistic story, that if you're looking for a positive side of this, it's think about what we can do before people encounter the police. How do we invest in communities? How do we create more programs that lead to reductions of crimes and that give people opportunities? And so me, that's where the opportunity is. And that's why I'm hopeful that we can see this here. All right, uh, Jason, um, why don't you close us out? What is the single most important uh, piece of uh, optimism that people can take from the book? We know we have serious problems. We know we're not doing a very good job of addressing those problems. What can we leave people with that would give them some comfort that perhaps there's a way out? Yeah, great. Uh, you asked me to be the optimistic one at the end, and Chris is supposed to be the good person for that. But uh, I will take that up. The, the nice thing for us is that people are aware of the severity of the problem. Uh, there is a growing awareness around the country that something is wrong. On both sides of the aisle, political aisle, both Democrats and Republicans, you see them criticizing the system and recognizing that reform is needed. Uh, the fact that we're having mass protests uh, shows that there's a widespread awareness that something is wrong. And I think when when social change has to start at some degree with people having that kind of awareness. Now, will that transform people into good voters? Probably not, but it will probably transform them into better voters. It will change and realign uh, the incentives of politicians to maybe start implementing some of those reforms. And so, you know, 
if you're a politician in that district and you recognize that your voters care about criminal justice reforms and like want to fix the system, just give Chris and me a call and we're happy to help you out and tell, tell you what it is you could do. So the fact that people care is a good thing um, because 20 years ago, they didn't. Right. Well, your book, I certainly hope, will be an important contribution um, to that discussion. It's been an important contribution to my thinking about these issues. And I want to thank both of you um, for the work that went into the book, for the clarity of the analysis, um, and for leaving us with at least some sense uh, of optimism that these problems are not intractable and can be fixed. So thanks for taking the time to be with us today.